Good evening. Good evening. Good to see all of you who are present on this evening. And um, I wish that I was uh, sitting in your seat. <laughs> and that would be a, a very easy and, and delightful for me just to sit in your place. But um, I don't think I had a choice today. <laughs> and was uh, drawn into this. Uh, but glad to be here and shall not be uh, long and to be here timely. In the printed bulletin, it just only says uh, the phrase milk and honey, but as I title this, uh, I want to preface it by saying God's promise, God's promise of milk and honey. God's promise of milk and honey in Numbers 14 and, and 8. The Lord, if pleased with us, will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. At the very beginning of our worship, uh, there was a very warm greeting for everyone to be here at the beginning of the semester of the new year. And I'd like to also add my welcome as well to those who are here for the first time, those who are returning, and for those uh, uh, who are, are here, just everyone, Happy New Year. The start of the new year and the beginning of a new semester are moments for reflection on our journey in life recalling the past, dreaming of a future, speculating on the reconfiguration of the present for achievement of dreamt possibilities. The beginning of a new year and the start of a new semester is a critical juncture at the in-between time of the fall and spring semesters. Whatever the past has been, good or bad, this moment in time marks a new opportunity we have arrived at a moment to dream anew of what can be, or at a moment of time to salvage an old dream, and in either case to recalibrate our plans and shift our priorities in order to achieve the imagined possibilities best described by using the metaphor of milk and honey, the good in life, and the quality of life promised by God. In Numbers chapters 13 and 14, the Hebrews describe Canaan as a land flowing with milk and honey. In actuality, the land is arid, a rough climate, populated by established communities of other peoples, with both the geography and the population posing several challenges for the survival of these Hebrew people. And yet they call it a land flowing with milk and honey because for them, as a nomadic people, the land represents a place for them to settle, to put down permanent roots, connecting firmly their peoplehood with a geographical location. They have a distinct identity and now a fixed place of habitation to go along with it. The milk and honey for these Hebrews means the inherent good which this land symbolizes for them. Now with respect to us who are involved in theological education, the milk and honey is the areas of endeavor and places of growth and the work of building and furthering the capacity of persons for various vocations and ministry. So what for us is the milk and honey? What's the good in theological education? Think about it. More than 77,000 students are pursuing theological education in the 270 plus ATS member schools in the United States and Canada. With mainline Protestant schools, among which Howard is included, about 45% of these schools are showing enrollment increases in the MDiv and the academic MA programs. The ATS has undertaken a major revision of standards of accreditation, but after further modifications this spring semester, will likely be approved by vote of the member schools in the June 2020 biennial meeting. Another massive undertaking 
is the recent study of and a published report on models of ministry, appreciating the best in conventional models and establishing new models of ministry. There are interesting conversations about and already shifts taking place in the direction of competency-based education, the practice and the absolute commitment of theological educators to teaching and assessment that demonstrates clearly students learning basic knowledge and skills for the practice of ministry and also at designated times in their degree programs. There are experiments in distance education, online and hybrid courses to supplement the traditional residential education. The world in which we live is becoming more complex and theological schools are providing education for the practice of ministry in a world that is marred by fragmentation, racial, religious, and political. Now, of course, people don't have to attend an ATS school or any accredited school, but those who do will be better prepared for effective ministry over the longest period of time in the world as it is now and as it will be in the foreseeable future. Theological education is a good place for us to be, and there is inherent good in theological education. Some schools are in decline for various reasons, while other schools are experiencing growth. And there are several factors that account for growth and success in theological education. And any one or more of these factors can be a part of Howard's story. There is milk and honey in theological education, and this milk and honey is not just for other schools. <laughs> this milk and honey is for us too. It appears that persons want the milk and honey, but not the labor, the sacrifice, and the struggle in order to obtain it. Moses sent out a team of 12 Hebrew spies, which each man represented his tribe to survey the territory and observe the people's living in Canaan. The spies bring back a report showing a huge cluster of grapes to prove that this land indeed flows with milk and honey. This is a good place. And though this land is a good place, they feared the other peoples living in the land. They are themselves, as they see, no match for them, the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites. <laughs> They see themselves as grasshoppers and said, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers and they saw us as grasshoppers too. They had internalized the inferiority that was projected on them. Now it's important to have an honest assessment of who you are. In Howard Thurman's book, The Creative Encounter, he makes a distinction between a person's self-fact and a person's self-image. A person's self-fact is their inherent self-worth and eternal determination of their value by God. A person's self-image are the perceptions, positive or negative, resulting from their social interaction with others. According to Thurman, too often persons allow their sense of self to be determined by self-images in this world of social relationships rather than by the self-fact established by God. Mm. Do you know who you are? Yeah. Do you know what you're capable of actually doing? Are you looking at yourself through the eyes of other people? Or are you looking at yourself through the eyes of God? Your possession of the milk and honey, if you obtain it, may very well depend on how you relate balance or counterbalance your self-image and self-fact. Rather than honestly estimating our abilities, resources, and potential, we sometimes and unfortunately overestimate the competition. Everyone looks like a giant if you think of yourself as a grasshopper. Every situation appears to be gigantic, insurmountable, if you believe the odds are always stacked against you. We make ourselves too small and we imagine others too big. Right. 
Well. But they're always having more than what we have. But they're always succeeding and are being somehow condemned to a perpetual state of failure. Mm -hmm. Somehow we must find within the depth of our souls the resolve to stand tall, the resolve to think big, yeah. the resolve to never settle for mediocrity, but strive for the best mm -hmm. and to be our best. We must pursue the milk and honey. In the future of theological education, those schools which will become the premier institutions won't, do, won't reach that stage because they're simply big. They won't get that really even because they have money. But they will get there because they have a distinct mission. They have a distinct identity and tradition. But they exhibit an openness to persons of other faiths and philosophies who are similarly on a quest for truth, righteousness, and justice. We can compete. And yes, we can win. In a competitive environment, five principles for the promotion of any theological school are accessibility, affordability, convenience, connectivity, and empowerment. And these principles, if you state them in questions, are just simply this. It's what you're offering within the reach and the range of students. Nobody's going to come if it's not accessible. Are you offering an educational experience which students can afford without enslavement to loans that they will never be able to repay? Wow. Come on. Are your courses offered at times and in formats most convenient for students? There's some very nice stores, just as a metaphor, they're very nice stores, but if you don't open up on time when anybody's going to come, no one comes and buys your merchandise. Are you connecting students to persons and churches and organizations and resources that will open the doors of opportunity that will contribute to their personal growth and gainful employment in ministry? Are you providing students with an education that actually empowers, enables them to do the ministries to which they are called? Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised when you see the so-called big schools fail and the so-called small schools winning and feasting on milk and honey. Presented with an opportunity to settle Canaan, the Hebrews hesitated. They were panic-stricken by the divided opinion among the spies. Two spies, Caleb and Joshua said, we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other 10 spies said, we can't. Mm -hmm. The naysayers saying we can't prevail. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew people learned in hindsight after incurring the wrath of God that this negative opinion was the wrong advice to follow. Mm -hmm. The Hebrews thought, well, maybe we can backtrack. Well, if we missed the opportunity, maybe we can go back again to do what we should have done in the first place. And so doing, they suffered a terrible defeat by the Amalekites and the Canaanites. The Hebrews did not act in a timely fashion when the opportunity first presented itself for them to enter the land of promise. Their response to fight the Amalekites and the Canaanites was reactionary, delayed, ill-timed, based on the intuition coming after the fact. Yeah. And rather than an act grounded in reason and reasonable faith, their actions are motivated by regret and desperation. They learn from this waste of effort and subsequent suffering and death that there's no substitute for faith-inspired action, strategic planning, and distributed organizational duties. An opportunity that is missed rarely represents itself in the same manner of its first appearance. Mm -hmm. A fact that was asserted by the Greek philosopher Heraclitus and affirmed by Alfred Whitehead's process metaphysics. The one constant it seems in life is the fact of change. That's constant. Heraclitus said, you cannot step twice in the same river for the waters are ever flowing onto you and you likewise are not the same. And Whitehead's process and reality explains so well in Monica Coleman's Making a Way Out of No Way, the basic unit of reality is the actual occasion. 
the small unit of reality to which God offers a continuous series of options for satisfaction and fulfillment. Coleman calls this process the essential nature, uh, the change in how it works, creative transformation, which is the realization of the actual occasion that is anything and any, everything that acts on the lures, the opportunities that God presents. For the milk and honey, you not only have to do the right thing, but you also have to do it at the right time. And timing is everything. Now Moses interceded for the Hebrews who incurred the wrath of God. God is forgiving, but also just. And God declared that these Hebrews would eventually enter and possess the promised land with its milk and honey. But it will be a new generation that will do so. The opportunity will come around again, but it will be for a different generation. Notwithstanding, Caleb and Joshua will survive. They will live long enough to see the day and enjoy the milk and honey with this new generation. In theological education, we must be intentional about connecting the generations. The dreams of the youth must engage the traditions held by the elders. And how the Thurman's combined volume, Deep River, and the Negro spiritual speaks of life and death. He says, despite the primary secular and political character of the civil rights movement, it found resources and, of inspiration and courage and the spiritual insights that have provided a windbreak for our forefathers and mothers against the brutality of slavery and the establishing of the ground of hope undimmed by the contradictions which held them in tight embrace. All of those who are most involved in the throes of the struggle were not aware of the dimensions of this flow of courage from the past. Nevertheless, it was a brooding presence in myriad rallies in a thousand churches that gave refuge and support to young and old in the heights and depths of the agonies of the 1960s. Too often the youth, as true of the 1960s and even today, are seeking to build a future without the benefit of the past and connection to previous generations who have already dreamt and strove to accomplish a grand vision themselves. As pointed out by Lincoln and Mamiya, what is often overlooked is the fact that many aspects of black cultural practices and some major social institutions had religious origins they were given birth and nurtured in the womb of the black church. The future of theological education belongs to persons who will be the leaders into the decades of tomorrow. They will need expert mentors who will articulate for them the traditions and histories of our people. My experience here at Howard is nothing short of amazing. And I'm not talking about the bad. <laughs> but nothing short of amazing. During my own years as a divinity student at Vanderbilt, I was a Kelly, Miss, Kelly Miller Smith scholar. And on many days here at Howard, I see the 1945 class picture of Kelly Miller Smith opposite the office door on the fourth floor uh, on Holy Cross Hall. As a beneficiary of his legacy, I've always felt an obligation to bear witness to his life, his ministry, and model of leadership. Kelly Miller Smith was pastor of First Baptist Capitol Hill. Often when I'm in Nashville, I pass by the church all the time. He served several terms as the president of the NAACP in Nashville. He founded the Nashville Christian Leadership Council an affiliate of the Southern Leadership Conference that was led by Martin Luther King, Jr. But his greatest distinction, his greatest accomplishment, was his mentoring of several young people who became leaders in the Nashville student movement, which drew hundreds of students from American Baptist College, Fisk University, Meharry Medical College, Tennessee State University, and Pearl High School, 
most notably Diane Nash, James Bevel, Bernard Lafayette, John Lewis, and your Washington, D.C. Mayor, Marion Barry. Okay, amen. These and other students will eventually take on leadership roles in the Southern, excuse me, in the Southern, Southern Christian Leadership Conference and also in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And some of them went on to serve in elected political offices at the city, the state, and the federal level. Now, when the next generation of Hebrews settled Canaan, Caleb and Joshua from the previous generations were there with them. Caleb is remembered for his testimony of how God preserved him long enough to witness their settlement of Canaan. Yes, yes, yes. And he staked his claim to the land of promise. And when they arrived, he had said, Give me this mountain. It's mine. I have the strength to possess it. The future of theological education retains the best of our tradition and involves those elders most capable of clarifying its relevance to the vision and the work of a new generation. We'll get to the land together. Yes. We'll have milk and honey together. If we would but hear the new generation saying, Oh, come and join our youthful band. Our songs and triumphs share. We soon will reach the promised land and rest forever there. Come and go to that land. Come and go to that land where I'm bound. Where I'm bound. There's milk and honey in that land. Come now. There's milk and honey yes, sir. in the land. There's milk and honey in the land yes. where I'm bound. Well. The Lord, if pleased with us, mm. will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. God's milk and honey is for us too. Mm.